Now, tell me your, your name, Clarence. Yes. Tell me your name. Please. Tell me your full name. Full what is name. your name? It's yes. just Clarence. Just Clarence. Yeah. Is your last name Rusk? Oh, yes, Katie. Okay. And where were you born? When was I born? Yes. July 11th, 1897. And where were you born? Where? Where were you born? Oh, out on a little farm two miles south of Tallala, but we call Tallala our hometown, you know. Tallala was your hometown, and it was in Indian Territory? Which? It was in Indian Territory? Oh, Oklahoma didn't become a state until 1908. I see, I see. Did you grow up on a farm? Which? You grew up on a farm? Yeah, yeah, sure did. Had a big farm there, very successful in a way. Of course, my dad died when I was 16, and I had to only got two years in high school. I see. After you stopped high school, you were farming? Yes. After you quit high school, you farmed? You farmed then after your dad died? Not quite so loud. Oh, you farmed after your dad died? Oh, I had to take over the farm after my dad died when I was, had two years in high school. So you were about 16? Yeah. Yeah. My dad died when I was 16. And then World War II, World War I, sorry, started in 19... When did you go into the war? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I had all the... Reason, you know, I didn't have to go to the camp at all. I, there with my mother and that big farm, I, I could have stayed out there just as easy as fall off the log backwards. But uh, I had read a book about the Rusk, R-E-R-S-K, and uh, in this book, it was a very nice book, hardcover and everything. I got it somewhere, and it was several rusts in that and some of them was lieutenants and colonels and so forth you know and i thought well now my younger brother won't have to go and my two older brothers they won't have to go and i never asked my mother whether i could go or stay at home I, and the boy I went to school with, he's my age and everything, and uh, uh, I, we, went, we had to go to Clamore, Clamore, Oklahoma, and to, red, to red shirt, you know. We just got us a little bottle, and you know what, and went to a lawyer, and told him we waived all exemptions. Well, he didn't have any exemptions, but I had plenty, but anyhow, I just waived all exemptions. I got home, told my mother, you know, she caught a train the next morning. <laughs> Bless her old heart. <laughs> Reading ten kids, no conveniences. Yeah, everything was old, you know. We never had a car of any kind. Never saw a car uh, until after I was about 16, after you and my father died. We had a wonderful good crop that year, so my older brother decided to get a Ford. You had to crank it, you know. Oh, we had a great time with that. And But, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <coughs> uh, he and I went down and waved uh, all exemptions to go, and they called me. And I said, my mother went down the next day, and she got me off for 30 days. And then, and at the end of 30 days, people over the country, were dying by the hundreds from this influenza. And they called me off that time for another 30 days. So, 
at the end of that, they called me again, and they took me that time. And uh, uh, all I got was a trip to <coughs> Deming, New Mexico, at Camp Cody. And uh, <coughs> that was a real flat country there. My, I never saw so much wood. You know, they had to cook with wood. They had to heat with wood. There was oh, never such a pile of wood in my life. There was this big wood, big stove, you know. And we was there just 60 days. We got all of our shots. And I was, as I say, was there 60 days. And uh, I gained 20 pounds. <laughs> Let me tell you, my dear friend, I never sat at such tables in my life. I'll never sit at such tables again. Oh, they, they set a table for the king. Mm. Not only our camp, but all of them, you know. They fed the boys the very best. They sure did. Well, we got all of our shots there, and, and uh, 30 days more, I'd have been on the road to Europe. Asia, wherever it is, wherever it was. But uh, they, uh, after 30 days there, I mean 60 days there, the armistice was signed. Ah. And the uh, boy that I went with the first time, which I was sorry I didn't get to go along. <coughs> he got a cross and was ready for front line duty when the armistice was signed. So that boy saw a lot of stuff that I never got to see, you see. Mm -hmm. But I came home and came back and got a diploma, discharge papers there. El Paso, Texas, and the diplomas laid around there for a home. I mean, a, a discharge. I thought, well, I'll look at that. About two weeks, and you know what it said on that discharge? What? Commanding officer. Oh, my. Uh, when I got home, those fellas, they couldn't believe it. They said, well, I've been in the Army for two years, and all I got was just a buck private. but but they had their eye on me from the beginning, I don't know why. Some of the rest was pretty good military men, you know. Mm -hmm. That's all I could figure out. They keep a record on all that stuff. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you had a short service, but you got a lot of good training. Now, I didn't hear that. I said, it sounds like you weren't in the service a long time, but you got some very good training. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> uh, there were two fellows I knew there, you know. One of them was personally I knew. That boy went to skin and bones while he was there. I don't know what they've done with him. And the other one, there was one other one that went to skin and bones. Mm. They, Worrying, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't take it. Ah. And, but that's how, that was the only two that I knew of. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, mostly like me, they gained weight and ready to fight. Good. Old John Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. Right. What did you do after the war? What did you do after the war when you came home? Oh, my younger brother, mother decided he was kind of getting a little bit rowdy. And she, she called in and we sat down and talked together. And she said, Clarence, if you think, you think that we're going to take the farm over, uh, if, if, if you would leave. And I said, now, mother, if that's what you want, I'm ready to go. 
And uh, so that's what I, that's when I left the farm. And I was going with a girl that was cashier of a bank down there in Oklahoma. And I thought, well, if I'm going to get mixed up with some bankers, maybe I ought to know something about it. So I went to John Zenas College at Muskogee, Oklahoma, and took a course in banking. And I'm sure glad I did that. It's helped me more ways than one through life. And, uh, but um, the, the young man and I was, was chum together there at, uh, uh, with, uh, there at Muskogee. And uh, we worked. We, we took up the dishes like they do up here at first, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was always a beautiful brand new one. We got two and a half to three dollars every night we was there. <laughs> we just went in the nights. And that sure helped us. And so then I got, I kind of beat him through. And I went over back over to Tulsa. And, Stayed in the YMCA there, seeing what I could find or maybe to do, and, and uh, uh, while I was there, my friend back at Muskogee wanted me to come and go to Mo Beaumont, Texas with him. And I said, well, what are you going down there for? I said, he said, there's a big job coming up down there, a big welding job. Uh, I said, well, I can't weld. Well, he said, you can herd cattle. <laughs> he knew I had some cattle, you know. And uh, so I put him off, talking on the phone. I put him off and I put him off. And he finally said, if I would pay your way, would you go with me? And I said, well, I can't turn you down. So I left everything behind and went clear to Beaumont, Texas with him. And that was a new country for me, I'll tell you. And uh, got down there and I don't know what's so wrong. I went out and worked 10 days there on some hike lines, uh, just scoot line out in the field there. You know, at one time, Spinnertop was one of the great oil fields there, and I probably is yet for I know. It was a wonderful oil field there at Spindletop, Beaumont, Texas. Well, I don't know. I went out the job and started up and I went out there and, and uh, they found out that there wasn't any welders available so they sent me and three others back to Beaumont and taught us how to weld and paid us four dollars a day. Now, that's the first time in history I ever heard of it, paying you to learn a trade. Yes. Yes, it is. Was I lucky or that? And I learned that I welded on both pipelines from uh, all east and west of Texas, all of Texas, and Kansas, and Oklahoma, Missouri. Or no, let's see. The five states is Kansas, let's see, Texas and Louisiana, Oklahoma and Missouri. And Kansas. And, and Kansas? Okay, one other one there. What was that? Was it Kansas? Was the fifth state Kansas? Which was the fifth state Kansas? Oh, yes, Kansas. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll leave that to me on. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you want me to tell you a little story? Yes. <clears throat> I was a welding inspector. I got to be a welding inspector. Oh, uh, I went, I, every place I went, I was in demand. And uh, right here in Lawrence, I was a welding inspector. And Vernon and Peter Wells were not born yet. Can you imagine that? They weren't here yet. And today, they are two of my best friends. Ah. Can you 
you imagine that? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. And, uh, of course, I think for my, my last and uh, exciting wells, I find well was the largest. It was from the uh, it started in Oklahoma City after that big gusher there. You know, it wasn't so much oil there, it was the gas pressure. And it would blow that little old steel of gas for a mile and a half. Mm. Get it just all over the cars and <laughs> oh my. But they got it shut in and we laid a 20 inch line all welded. And, uh, to start out with, I didn't think. They called me there to talk to the center, had a job for me, and that's what it was, inspection for that big line, big 20 inch line. And uh, we started up, and there's one fellow there, I knew his welding, and you know, he, uh, I didn't like his welding at all. And I told him right to his face that I didn't like the way he welded. It would not stand the test of what they expected. And uh, that was all I ever heard about it. Now that was the first day. And the second day, morning, word was out there that he was fired. Fired from the job. Now how in the world were they? I never said it would be anybody else but Bob himself. And I didn't like his welding then. So they brought, somebody heard that and it went to the officials and they had enough respect for me to, and, knew, and, and enough knowledge that I knew what welding was and there he was far the next morning. And boy, he walked over and took a swing at me. He's going to beat me up. He's big enough to do it too. And uh, two welders sitting there, ready to start. They laid their welders, welding torch down, run over there and said, Rusty, everybody called me Rusty at that time. Said, don't take a thing off of him. We all know you're fighting. Is that, is that helpful? Yes. Oh, uh, I never thought of such a thing. Mm. Uh, I had just, I just had great help everywhere I went. That's wonderful. That speaks well of you. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. How old were you when you retired? Uh, 30. 31 or something like that. No, when you retired, how old were you? 31, I think. 30. The, the welding, you know that welding, that settling welding played out just like you turn a lamp out. Oh. It just quit all of a sudden. And, uh, Later on, look, they were trying to get electric welding to go in there. I thought I had to do some welding. I had to do over some electric welding, quite a bit of it. And, uh, but they got it to go in, and you know that Alaskan pipeline? It was all electric welding. Ah. Yeah. And, and, and then after I retired, I retired over at Hessen, Kansas at the compressor station, one of the largest and most beautiful ones they had. <laughs> and uh, after I left there, <coughs> the, uh, there was a line laid several years before called, it was an oil line, and <laughs> that was called the Teapot Dome. That's way back there, you know. I read about it. And, uh, it was an oil line coming from Wyoming to uh, Wichita, I believe. Yeah, yeah. At the river, at the river, Henry, there. <laughs> and uh, so, that's in Kansas. After I left there, I got two more big compressor motors put in, which cost an enormous lot of money. And this old oil line was converted back there along there somewhere and turned into the Hesson station. And uh, that was after I left 
there. And my goodness, that hiss sensation, I'm telling you, it, it puts gas over here to, to pick in Lawrence and Kansas City. And all along the way, hmm. this gas industry is a very, very big, expensive affair. And, uh, Clarence, did you ever marry or have a family? Which? Did you ever get married and have a family? Get lose. No, did you get married or have a family? Oh, listen, my dear. <laughs> I saw a few marriages and uh, I made up my mind I'd never get married. Oh. I had a girl over here and a girl out there and one bar of the and one back over here. And, <laughs> No marriage for the life I was leading. But the girl over here at Belton, Missouri, I was doing a quite a bit of welding over there around Belton. I helped put the first gas lines in Grandview, that little station south of Kansas City. I've done a lot of work for all of that. And, you know, <laughs> I guess it's all right to tell it. Uh, I well over there. She was just finishing her high school and you know I found out I was fourteen fourteen years older than she was. But she was just as big as I was, a nice looking old young woman, just finished high school, you know. And well she'd heart that she was uh, I forget twenty or so anyhow I was fourteen years. And you know, we was out riding around one evening, and uh, uh, when she come back in, she, she, I know she was kind of walking the floor for some reason, and finally she walked over to her mother and said, Mother, Clarence and I are getting married Christmas Eve. That was leap year. Uh-huh. Uh, she knew I would never ask her, but she was a girl that anybody would be glad to have. I've always said she made a man, made a man out of me. <laughs> I really did. I was just scheduled for a big old bum. But we got married and went down a little farm. We walked there south of course uh, uh, Independence, Independence, Kansas. And it wasn't much of a farm, but I really dolled that farm up, and we had several friends come out, and even that, hey, here's the story, I, the governor of Kansas, uh, and he had a friend just right across the, from the east side, and I had my place posted, and the state had turned the quail hair quails in there. And a lot of game on that group. <coughs> and I heard that shooting going on. And so I took off and tried to roll there afoot and caught up with him. And I said, Well, who gave you permission to get, uh, for a hunt here? And, uh, well, nobody. I said, Well, this place is posted three places and uh, you couldn't help but see one of them and while uh, I was talking uh, the fellow spoke up and he said well I'm sorry I said I am the governor of Huxley or something like governor of Kansas <laughs> 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 oh and they ribbed me afterwards about running the governor of Kansas so <laughs> and then here just that uh, two or three weeks ago you might have thought, I've got a letter just out of the blue sky. What's our governor? Oh, see. I see. Graves? Graves. 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 Yeah, I see Graves. I got just a personal letter from him. It's just, I don't know what caused him to do that. Okay. Uh, Maybe he found out what a good, ripe old age you've lived to. What's up there? 
Maybe he found out what a good ripe age you've lived to. Oh, I, I, it's, it's been a great exciting for me, I don't have to say. Uh, yeah. Did you and your wife have children? I have one daughter. She lives in Duluth, Minnesota. She she gonna be she's gonna be down here on the eleventh, you know, for her birthday. For your birthday? She's a she's a girl. Uh, she has a lot of money on her. She has a grand piano that, that I bought for her. Stayed in my home there in Hesperia, uh, Lawrence, until about a year and a half ago. She put an addition on her house and finally come down and got it. A grand piano. She was skilled in piano. She gave a recital in Kansas City one day while I was home. And I was surprised. You know, when she finished that whole audience, that she's had a standing ovation. How wonderful. Oh, she couldn't do it there. But, of course, she was skilled in the ballet, too. And, uh, she was in a ballet gang up in New York, and uh, they had a play up there, out in the country. They all have those places, you know, out in the country a little bit. And, and, oh, it got out that somebody was asking them, that news said, how come all these millionaires are up here from Florida to New York? That's a lot of millionaires up and down that coast, you know. Mm -hmm. And the story was that all oh, they come forward just to see some pretty girls. Well, it, was, it had to all be pretty, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah, they were all pretty girls. A very nice program. I got to see that. That's wonderful, Claire. That was a ballet program. Mm-hmm. Now she's teaching them. Oh, now great. She's... She's too old, of course. That, you know, they grow out of it. They they get that that ballet is is it's work. Yes, it is hard work. Yeah. I think she finally gave it up about thirty, about a little before she was thirty, <coughs> and uh, she's teaching ballet now. Mm -hmm. her, uh, big home, not, not a home. Uh, she had a. <coughs> She had to rent a hall and pay so much, but she seems to be doing pretty well. How long were you and your wife married? Uh, well, from 32 Well, I believe something. I believe the way I remember it was back uh, 60, 60 or 68 years. Ah, that's a good long time. Oh, yeah. You see, <coughs> well, uh, I can't just think what year that was. But it's, been, it's been about five years ago and she passed away. She had this miserable cancer. Mm. You know, I always want to think about her and Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, the richest woman in the world, was about the same age as my wife, uh, Anna, Anna. She had cancer and you know she died. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I thought, well, it kind of relieved my pain for uh, what I want to say is that, that money don't save. No, it doesn't. Don't save if it's your time to go. No, no, it sure doesn't. How long have you lived here, Clarence? How long have you been here at Baldwin Care? Oh, <laughs> we left Independence. I got. I uh, was sick of that old place though out there. A fellow drove up to my house one day and he said he heard about me and wanted me to come over and help him start that old 
personal sections of it. Well, that was something new to me. I couldn't do hate the Lord at all. I would just do a lot of hard work. <coughs> <clears throat> you know, they built this new station at Heston, Kansas. That's 30 miles, 25, 30 miles north of Wichita. And uh, I just put my bid in for an engineer job there without asking my wife or anybody else. I was sick of that old station there. Independence. I still had my farm and my cattle there, a little bunch of cattle. And I liked it. And, you know, if we'd have had conveniences there, I think my wife would have liked it too. But with no conveniences there that was all at that time. Like water and gas and oil. Uh, uh, water and gas and telephone. We didn't even have a telephone. Uh, all right. How how long have you been here at, at the Baldwin Care Center? When did you come here? How old were you? When when did you come here to live? When did you come here to Baldwin to live? To Baldwin? Yes. Oh, it's been just about a year now. Oh, oh really? About a year. Be a year in October. You lived in your own home till then. Yeah. I I bashed that four years after my wife passed away. And, uh, they got, I was getting a little uh, wobbly, and they thought I'd fix it for a disaster there or something. Decided I'd better get, uh, they found out about this, my, wife, my daughter found out about this place, and, and uh, decided that it might be the place for me. Mm -hmm. That's how I got here. Well, you've lived a long, full life. But you've lived a long, full life. You have. You've had a long, full life. Oh, you bet I have. I'll tell you, I, I don't. I sit here day after day and I don't get lonesome. I've got so many things that will happen that I can think about, you know. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're still interesting to me how, how it happened and why they happened and all that, you know. <coughs> Do they feed you pretty good? Do yeah, they I, feed you pretty good? What? Do they feed you pretty good? Oh, it kind of gets old what they feed us, but then I, I, it seems like everybody thrives on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, are there any other stories you'd like to tell me today? Or are you tired? Are there any other stories you want to tell us today, or are you getting tired? Well... Uh, I guess I, uh, I don't know whether I've told you the whole thing. Uh, uh, you know, we worked from San Antonio, Texas to Oakland. There in Texas, they claim that is. Well, that's where I got my arm and discharged at El Paso. That's the e western part of Texas. <clears throat> and the story was that they get this further miles is further from El Paso to Orange, Texas than it is from Orange, Texas to Chicago. I like to tell a little different story about it. Texas. I said, got me down there, and I said, you know, it's two, two, two full years before I can find my way out. <laughs> I've done a lot of welding in Texas. Done a lot of welding over here in Missouri. Yeah, I laid one right across from. Uh, I mean, I was welding inspector from. All the way down here. There's a station down here, all the way, you know. Yes. And uh, 
Well, then the line there from there up to St. Joe. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a little story. <laughs> uh, you know, we finished up, and they always had me pretty much as well. And I was a bell, what they call the bell hole welder. You know what that is? No. Well, that's where you have to start on the bottom. The pipe is tied to where you can't roll it anymore. You have to start at the bottom and come to the top. And you have to jump over on the other side and start at the bottom and come to the top. Ah. And not all of them like to do that, but I didn't mind it. <laughs> I've done a lot of bell hole welding. And, and uh, let's see what was that other part that I want to say. Sulfur did you ever see in your life? Not very much. That's the way with all of us. <clears throat> but the neat manufacturing, I don't know why, but they picked four of us guys to go over there. They wanted to change a. They, this sulfur is mined about 400 feet below the ground. Ooh. And oh, that's a big thing, the sulfur. And I guess it's the largest one in the United States that I know of. And uh, so when we was going over to it, we saw this something shining in the sun. Didn't know what it was. And the closer we got, the better we could see it. And we got to it, it was a block of sulfur. It was 400 feet wide, 800 feet long. Oh my. And 40 feet high, I believe it was, or 30, 30 or 40. Oh, I never saw such a block of sulfur in my life. And the way they mined that sulfur, they drilled for it. And what we went down there for, they wanted to change those big steam engines from Mexican crude to uh, uh, to make uh, burn the gas. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, they didn't burn any Mexican crude. They wanted to change. They ch we changed it to. Uh, well, it was much cleaner, you know, burning gas. And uh, I never dreamed of such a thing in my life. They made a little railroad track along this 400 feet of sulfur. It's unbelievable. I just can't believe it after I saw it. And they put a little, small, about a quarter of a stick of dynamite and bore down in that, the sulfur settled. This sulfur comes out of the ground, a liquid pollen. And uh, it, they had this big, flat built, watertight, you know. And uh, they actually laid a railroad track while we was there, on the side, with a power shovel. And they loaded the train load of sulfur. Mm. Where it went to, I didn't know, never asked. <clears throat> but believe you me, I, I got around. I don't know how, but I back in, in Galveston, I believe it was, and, and there was a big boat docked there, and this train load of sulfur was there, ready to be loaded on this ship. Oh, and where this ship was going, I never did ask. I don't know why, but I wouldn't have known anywhere. But that's a 
unbelievable the things they've got in Tulsa. I mean, mm. Texas. Mm. Yeah, it's a big state. That was something that meant. I'll tell you, you had to go about 25 miles off of the highway down actually to this. They call it Gulf, Texas. Mm. And uh, I took my little first airplane ride there. The band would only take us, it just had a little old plane, you know. And it'd only take one at a time. And uh, I don't remember, it cost him not very much, but <coughs> he'd fly out over the Gulf there, you know, and we'd see the waters and uh, fly back over that little town. And I thought that was the prettiest little layout town I ever saw. It was just like a checkerboard. Mm. It was late and perfect. I think there's about four or five hundred people there, and that's all the industry they had was. Uh, oh, they had other little things there, I guess, but that was the main industry, you know. That's got mining sulfur. I don't know where that sulfur all went to. But I found out later that they, in, uh, they used sulfur in a lot of things, I guess. Yes. Well, you know what? We sure appreciate you telling your stories. It's uh, about 10 to 11, and I don't want to tire you out, and I know it'll be lunchtime pretty shortly. So we're going to.